or Abhijit. Abhijit is the official TA for this course, but Tom is more of an expert in Comsol than Abhijit is, I think. So if you need consultations uh, with him when I'm away, uh, I will ask him to be kind of... <laughs> you already did. <laughs> he gave them a hint. Yeah, the actual help that they needed. Hints weren't like gonna help. Like pretty much, it was just that last part with the drag. The whole How to calculate the drag yeah. coefficient? Okay. That's the part we could. Do. You you cannot calculate the drag coefficient because that's something that we defined. Comsol is a general PDE solver. What it can calculate for you is the net force exerted by the fluid on the particle. Okay, so there is a way where it uh, calculates integral quantities of anything that you want. So you need to integrate. This is why we went through in class, what are the steps that you need to do? You can now, if you understand that, you can ask Comsol to do the same uh, test for you, uh, the calculations for you. So it's going to do it numerically. Uh, so you need to identify the circular surface as the surface on which you want to calculate the stress and then the integral of the stress. So it will give you the total force. That means it will give you three components. Only one will be non-zero, the other two will be zero in this case. You take the force and then plug it into the definition for the drag coefficient. How do you define drag coefficient? Cd is equal to F over A divided by one half rho u squared. Okay, so you know the area, you know rho, you know u squared. You should know the rho that you put into the uh, code. So you plug in the F that is calculated, the force that is calculated by Comsol. That's how you get your drag coefficient. This is also valid for cylinder and for the sphere. Which one? The drag coefficient? Yeah. Yes, yes. The same definition applies for any shape. F is the net force exerted on that particle. Even if you have a stone, it has a drag and it's a net force exerted, resolved in the direction of the flow. And that's, that's how you define the drag forces. And what ballpark figure should be getting? Should you be getting the length of your drag coefficient? Because I did basically what you said, I was going to value. Negative 3,000. <laughs> no. The <laughs> negative sign may be that the direction of the force, yeah. okay, but uh, you, you need to convert that into drag coefficient and you need to validate that against this relationship. You have the drag for a sphere, for a cylinder, I didn't cover it in the class, but you will find it in other books. So you will have CB versus Reynolds number, okay. So at the lower Reynolds number, you know that it should be. 24 divided by RT. So the value that you calculate when you convert that into CD and plot it against the Reynolds number for which you have done the simulation, the graph should fall on that. You will get a few data points like that and it will start departing as you go to about Reynolds number of 40 or so. 20 or 40 will deviate from there. But for Reynolds number of up to 1, you should agree reasonably well with that. That is the point of this exercise is that with Comsol, you should be able to extend the solution much beyond the Stokes regime and you will get the weight at the end, at the rear end of the sphere or the cylinder. But in the uh, Stokes regime, you should be able to confirm that you are getting this value. So if you get the, for the force negative 3000 newtons or something, whatever it is, take that value and see that force is going to depend on uh, the viscosity of the fluid. For example, so different people may choose different viscosities, but all of you convert that into a corresponding Reynolds number and a corresponding drag coefficient, you will find that your data point falls close to the graph. Okay, so you may be doing a, a simulation for a loss number of 0 0.05 or you may be doing it for 0 0.01. Okay, but they should fall on, on that curve. Okay, and you need to use this uh, CD as equal to. F divided by A divided by one half rho u squared. So you fix this, you fix this, you know the area. You need, you, of course, from the you have to calculate the area for the diameter that we have used in your simulation. Okay, that's the projected area, the direction of the flow. And Comsol will give this out. And you plug that number in here and you calculate your CD. That's how we put it in the code. Um, when I'm in Comsol, I, uh, I see there is a Total stress and that. That is not force. Yeah, that's it. That's exactly what it is. When we do this in council, the council is a 2D. So we integrate along that circle, right? So, so you, so you need all this 
drag force will be Newton yes. per meter. So that's the important. For for a cylinder, for a cylinder, it will be Newton per meter because for a cylinder, it's the force per unit length of the cylinder. Okay. For a sphere, it will be Newton. It should be Newton. If you do it in axisymmetric case, uh, because it knows the surface area of the sphere, it's not infinite. For a cylinder, it's an infinite surface area. So it gives you per unit length, per unit meter. For a sphere, it's a finite surface area. So it should multiply that appropriately and give you just newtons. That's what I would expect. But uh, yeah. but I'm probably still, uh, what, what we get is newton uh, per meter in the sphere. Yeah. That cannot be true. Uh, you, you did pick axisymmetry as your geometry. Yes. Okay, I need to take a look at that because that's strange. Per meter, it doesn't make sense. Yeah, okay. It could be a bug in the code. <laughs> that's another thing that you have to... I mean, the, the units that they put could be an error, but it could actually be giving you uh, just the Newtons. You need to, you need to validate that, that, yeah. Okay, any other questions or comments on ComSol use? How did you find the analytical one? How long did it take you? <laughs> or, whatever. Yeah, maybe the first part. <laughs> okay, I'm glad that I asked you and I've given you more yeah. time. Yeah. Just go through that. And, uh, I have another question. Uh, the second problem, the string line, what is the meaning of string line? Stream line is contours of stream function. So if you have the stream function expression, you just pass it to a contour program in Maple or MATLAB. It will plot the contours of the stream function. That's your streamline. Streamline is a line on which a stream function has a constant value. So the tangent to which is your velocity vector. Okay. Yes, yes. There is a one of the you can draw vector plots, you can draw Streamlines. Oh, yeah, yeah. Streamline. Right, yeah, yeah. There is an option there in the post processing program, yeah. Rob, we just extended the deadline for the assignment by two weeks. <laughs> okay, so it's not due today. <laughs> because I want you to complete. A lot of people haven't completed it yet. So and I'm going to be away next week. That's why two weeks. I have a question for the first one. Very good uh, point. Yeah, yeah. You can, you can, and you must assume that. Otherwise, <laughs> <laughs> the math gets even more difficult. And it turns out that that is the only solution. Sine square theta term is the only one that will survive. Even if you don't make the assumption, look at it this way: if you don't make that assumption, what is the option that we have for getting the solution to that proper separation of variables? Right? So I apply the separation of variables, I get an ordinary differential equation in R and an ordinary differential equation in theta. And the theta equation will have these uh, sine, sine square, sine cube, that kind of a function, a series function in that. Um, and of all those, the ones that will satisfy your boundary condition will be only the one that has sine square theta in it. Okay, so. You can assume that for this purpose of this assignment, you can assume that the functional form for the interior one is the same as the one for the outer one. So the psi will have the same solution, just the boundary conditions will be different. So the constants would be different for the inner fluid and the outer fluid. So the question. Okay, any other questions? Okay, let me just briefly review what we saw in the last class. We started exploring this idea of a boundary layer theory and we looked at a simple ordinary differential equation to understand this concept of what a boundary layer is. 
So we looked at the spring dash part model, which is a second order ordinary differential equation with a constant coefficient. Now the key was if I set m equal to zero in that equation, m is the mass of the spring dash part system, I lose the second order term, the equation becomes first order. And these equations are called singular equations because they are getting multiplied by a small parameter. As that parameter goes to zero, the form of the equation changes, the highest order drops out. So a first order equation will have only one solution, whereas a second order equation will have two solutions. And these two solutions were this and the one, one solution for the first order system is given here. But you will notice that there is the same solution, what we call the slow solution appears in both. What we lose is the solution that is the fast solution, meaning solution that disappears very quickly. If m is small, then this term, because 1 over m would be very large, e to the power minus that term times t will go to 0 very quickly. And so that what gives rise to the so-called boundary layer behavior. And we saw that the solution, when I plot x versus t, will have a very sharp gradient. And then like this, it goes to 0. As long as m is very small, there is no oscillatory behavior, then this region is what we call the boundary layer. So in that region, we cannot ignore the second order term. Even though the mass is small, the derivative is very large. It has sharp changes in derivatives, so the product is of order unity still. So if you neglect that, what you would get is basically the first order equation with a solution that will have something like this. So it will agree with the outer solution, the slow solution, but it will not satisfy the no slip condition here, so it will not satisfy the inner region. And so the boundary layer theory in fluid mechanics is basically kind of extension of this idea. And we went through rather elaborate scaling argument to make this extremely fine balance between the various terms. We don't ignore a term like this because m is small, because it might be multiplied by a very large term. So the product may be still relevant in a certain region. And so when we did that, we found out that the continuity equation, both terms must be zero. Otherwise, you will have uh, inconsistency in the boundary layer approximation. And in here, you'll have momentum diffusion in the x2 direction, in the normal direction to the plate, and advection primarily in the x1 direction. Advection is convection of momentum in the x1 direction. So it's a balance between convection in the x1 direction and diffusion in the x2 direction. And this is the pressure term, which for a flat plate will be zero. But for non-flat objects, curved objects, that term will be given by the boundary layer theory at the edge of the boundary layer. So this is the, sorry, the potential flow theory at the edge of the boundary layer. Okay. So you need to get the, solve the potential flow problem, get the pressure distribution as a function only of x1 in the flow direction and impose that on as a driving force onto your boundary layer equation. The benefit that we had in addition was that without solving the differential equations, we could get what the nature of the boundary layer thickness is. It varies as 1 over square root of Reynolds number based on the length of the plate measured from the leading edge of the plate. Now, this is not a solution. This says says this is the functional form. There is a constant multiplication factor. What is that factor? We need to solve these equations to get that factor. That's what we are going to do today. Okay. Any questions on the scaling argument that we did? Please do review them. The scaling argument was basically to show that we cannot argue Reynolds number is large and throw out the uh, viscous term or Reynolds number is small and throw out the inertial term. We need to balance both terms and the reason is that if we do that, either we get the potential flow or the Stokes flow. Okay. And an example was this first order, uh, the ordinary differential equation, which is much more easy to understand. That just because m is small, we cannot neglect the first term because it gets multiplied by a large term. In the same way, just because viscosity is small doesn't mean that we can neglect the viscous term. That's what we did with the Euler equation, which does a good job of predicting pressure distribution but predicts no drag. Now we will be able to predict the drag. The problem in doing this fine balance is we end up with an equation that is still nonlinear. 
this equation has nonlinear term, inertial term on the left hand side. So there is no analytical way of solving it. So what we are going to do today is look at what Blasius did. It's called the Blasius solution to transform these two equations. Now we have two equations in two unknowns. The two unknowns are V1 and V2. Two equations are the continuity and the X1 momentum equation. What happened to the X2 momentum equation? From last lecture, when we did the scaling analysis, we found out the X2 momentum equation is trivially satisfied, except for dp dx2 is equal to 0. That's the only thing that we can get. Everything else is small compared to the X1 momentum equation. And that is what led us to this relationship for the pressure gradient, because it says the pressure at the edge of the boundary layer is the same as the pressure throughout inside the boundary layer, because pressure gradient in the X2 direction is small, is 0. Okay, so we talked about in the last class uh, the nature of similarity between this and the impulsively started plate. Now, we need to understand, to be able to solve this equation, we need to understand what is the nature of that partial differential equation. Some of you may have seen this in a PDE course, some of you may not. Let me just review that and introduce this idea of classification of partial differential equations. Before that, let me identify the boundary conditions for our problem. So this is the plate and we are approaching this plate with a velocity u and this is the boundary layer and we want to be able to predict that velocity profile. Outside the boundary layer, the velocity field is u, potential flow field. Okay, That's the physical description. So how does it translate into mathematical boundary conditions? The first boundary condition is v1 at x1 equal to 0. Remember, x1, x2 are these. This is x1, that is x2. So x1 equal to 0 for all x2 is this line that you see here. So at the entrance, what is the velocity? The velocity is obviously u, the free stream velocity. Okay. Then we are saying, okay, what is v1 for all x1 and x2 equal to 0? What is that plane? That is the plate itself because x2 is 0. For all x1, along the plate, what is the velocity v1? That's an oscillate condition. That is equal to 0. Okay. And then we have v2. Okay, remember we have both v1 and v2 as unknowns and we have two equations. Okay, the continuity and the x1 momentum equation. So what does this condition say? v2 along the plate is equal to 0. What does that imply? Physically. There is no? There is no normal velocity to the plate. So it is a solid plate. It is not a porous plate. Okay. Now, people have extended this to a porous plate later on. So I could have, for example, an injection of some air into this. Okay, I could inject air, then I would make this velocity as non-zero. Or I could suck some air through that. Okay, So I could change the direction of the velocity through the porous plate. Why would you want to do that? What, would you, what do you think would happen if I inject a fluid or extract or suck a fluid out of that plate? What would it do to the boundary layer thickness? If I'm injecting it, it will become thicker, right? If I remove the material, it will become thinner, okay? So if you want to control the drag, for example, this is a technique that has been thought about in airplane design. If you want to reduce the drag on the wing or on the body, can you inject or remove air so that you control the boundary layer thickness, okay? The boundary layer thickness is going to be directly related to the shear stress. We are going to see that very soon, how it is related. You can intuitively see it. If I make the thickness small, what happens to the shear rate? Small. Will it be small or large? What is the shear rate? Tau. Shear stress tau is mu times dv1 dx2. Okay. dv1 is the velocity gradient. You can think of this as the velocity change between these two points. And d delta x2 is your boundary layer thickness. So the boundary layer thickness becomes large, small. The velocity is the same. Velocity difference is the same. The shear rate is going to go up. That means the shear stress is going to go up. That means the drag is going to go up. Okay. So if you really want to decrease the drag, what you should do is inject so that you can make the boundary layer thickness thicker, delta larger. Okay. 
If you want to reduce the bound, the drag, remember in, in, in aerodynamic design, there are two forces you need to worry about. One is the lift force, which lifts the plane from the ground into the air. That's a force that is acting normally. Okay? Okay, and that is basically an integral of all the forces, the pressure distribution and the stress distribution in the normal direction. So you will have a distribution of forces around any object, even for a circular uh, cylinder or a sphere, you will have that. And you have to integrate that and resolve that into two components. After you integrate that, you resolve that into these two components. So the lift force is the one that lifts the plane. Okay, and the drag force is the one that basically offers resistance to the plane's motion. If you have zero drag, then you don't need any energy. Right? The plane will just go forever. Right? So the objective is to reduce the drag. So the question is, how can you reduce the drag? That means you need to, there is a boundary layer here. You need to increase that boundary layer thickness somehow. So by injecting material through the surface, this is the surface through which drag is experienced. So if you can increase that, you can decrease the drag. Of course, I don't think it's practice anywhere, but it's a thought anyway. Right? Um, so in this particular case, we are saying that V2 equal to zero. There is no injection or extraction of fluid, so it is impenetrable. And the next condition says, and notice this condition very carefully. It says that V1 for all x1, that is at the edge of this boundary layer, for all x1 at x2 equal to infinity, that is asymptotically, as you go far away from the plate, this goes to u. Okay. So remember, infinity is a concept. What we really mean here is as x2 goes to delta at the edge of the boundary layer. But I don't have a precise definition for the boundary layer thickness delta. As I said, it's an asymptotic approach to the free stream velocity. So we can arbitrarily define if it reaches 99% of the potential flow, then you treat that as the edge of the boundary layer. There's no clear boundary that marks this. Okay, so those are the boundary conditions. And uh, now we need to learn a little bit about the nature of the partial differential equation. Now let's go and look at those two equations and see what do we learn from them. This equation, what is the highest order term in the continuity equation? Second order, where do you see the second order term? It's just the first order equation. The first order derivatives are involved. In the second equation, you have the highest order is the second order derivative. Okay. So the number of boundary conditions that you write should match with the, the highest order. You know, a second order equation, you need two boundary conditions, a third order equation, you need three conditions, etc. So in this case, it is second order in x2. So in the x2 direction, this is x1 and x2. In the x2 direction, we already gave one condition here and one condition there for v1. But it's only first order in v1. Okay, So we need only one condition in the x1 direction. That's what we gave here at the inlet. So the conditions that we have prescribed are consistent with the order of the terms that are appearing in this equation. Now, for partial differential equations, how many of you have never heard of classification in terms of parabolic, elliptic, hyperbolic? So, others have heard about it, right? Classification of PDEs. Okay. Does anybody remember what, what they are physically, intuitively, mathematically? Anything you remember? Yeah? Good, good, good. You remember? The equations are hyperbolic, elliptic, I don't remember. Any Laplace equation, Poisson equation is elliptic, conduction equation is uh, parabolic, wave equation is hyperbolic. Uh, that's the extent to which I think you might have seen it in an undergrad course. Um, if you take a PDE course, they will tell you that it actually depends on something called the characteristic curves and whether the characteristic curves are real or imaginary. And that depends on the discriminant of a quadratic term that you form from your partial differential equation. So this is a template of a partial differential equation that is typically used 
to understand this classification. It will be very difficult to apply this classification to the Navier-Stokes equation. Why? For one reason, in this equation, it is a linear equation. The template uses a linear equation. So u is the unknown that I'm solving for that appears linearly everywhere. And a, b, c, d are either constants or functions of x and y or x1 and x2. Okay. So in this particular case, let's treat them as constants. a, b, c, d, e, f are coefficients that are constants. And then if this discriminant that you need to calculate, b squared minus a, c, is less than 0, then we call it elliptic. If it is equal to 0, then we call it parabolic. And if it is greater than 0, it's hyperbolic. Okay. This actually comes from the classification of conic sections. Do you know anything about it from your know, high school algebra? You would have seen if you have a quadratic equation, okay, x square over a square plus y square over b square equal to 1, what does it describe? x square plus y square equal to 1 so describes a circle. x square over a square plus y square over b square equal to 1 satisfies. It describes the ellipse. a and b are the major and minor axis uh, uh, length. So, and if you have x square over a square minus y square over b square equal to 1, then it describes a hyperbola. So, the classification of ellipse, hyperbola, or parabola comes from quadratic curves. So, here we have extending, we are extending that notion to a second order partial differential equations. Okay, So, the magnitude of this determines whether you have real roots or imaginary roots. And that's what decides in the quadratic curve whether you have an ellipse parabola or hyperbola. So, the same thing decides here. And that's why it's named in a similar way. But physically, what does it mean? As Catherine said, for wave equation, you have hyperbolic. Okay, So, that's the physics. Okay, So, if you have any wave phenomena, when you're trying to write down an equation for that, it will exhibit hyperbolic behavior. An example of that? Do you remember anything about wave equations? Okay. Physical example. Let me give you an example. This is something that you would have seen from fluid mechanics, but you would have commonly experienced at home. If you have hot water running and you have the, you're standing near the sink and hot water is running and you shut down the tap, what happens? Has anybody experienced you, go, you don't go near the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> kitchen is a very good place for chemical engineers because there are a lot of chemical engineering phenomena that you can explain from colligative properties, pressure cooking, why does things cook when you add salt, why do they think, uh, cook faster, all these things can be explained. Exactly. What is that? Oh, that's one example of... Uh, wave equation, hyperbolic yeah. equation. But the example that I was describing to you, if you don't believe me, go home today. Open. No, no, no. I want you to hear what happens. Keep the, yeah, keep the water running, particularly from a hot water tap. It doesn't occur if you do the cold water one. And then shut the hot water tap abruptly. And you will hear a bang. You will hear some vibration. That's called water hammer. Okay. That phenomena is described by a hyperbolic equation. Basically, what happens is there is a, when you are shutting it, there is a pressure pulse that you are creating at the tap. And the pressure pulse propagates through the pipe to the other end and then comes back, it goes back and forth. Okay. And that's a wave phenomena. Okay. And tsunami, what is a tsunami? It's a pressure pulse produced by an earthquake. Right. So deep under ocean, if there's an earthquake, and that sets up a pressure change locally. And that pressure pulse propagates tens of thousands of miles, if you want, without being disturbed. And then once it come, hits the shore, of course, you, get, you see the devastating effect. You won't even know that it is propagating, but it's a pressure pulse that propagates. Those kind of wave phenomena are captured. The, the other one is the sonic boom. When you have a, a hypersonic transport plane that is crossing the sound barrier, you will hear a boom. Okay. And that is also captured by uh, a hyperbolic <laughs> equation. So the Navier-Stokes equation can behave in that hyperbolic manner in a lot of these situations because the equations governing the water hammer, the sonic boom, the tsunami, they're all Navier-Stokes equations. Right? That's a good question. Uh, it, it should happen, but you don't hear it loud enough because the effect is not very large. 
you need a little bit of compressibility for the pressure wave to propagate very effectively. Um, so with hot water, you'll have often some dissolved gases in there or steam. So it's a little bit more, the compressibility of hot water is a little bit larger than the compressibility of the cold water. Um, for <coughs> you will have that effect, but it will dissipate itself very quickly in gas. Okay, for liquid, it has the ability to transmit over long distances. That's why tsunami can travel hundreds of thousands of miles. If you have such a pulse in gas phase, it will dissipate within a few meters. Okay, so you won't have that. Uh, effect felt. Now that's hyperbolic. What is elliptic? Elliptic equations are those equations which are well, uh, they have a well-defined boundary. So anything that you affect on the boundary condition will influence the flow field inside. Whereas in hyperbolic and parabolic problems are talked about as prob evolutionary problems. Where I have used that word. Okay, evolutionary meaning they evolve in time. They, the pressure is propagated in time. In parabolic equations also have the same behavior. Things propagating either in time or in space, but in a marching direction. Whereas in elliptic problem, you have a closed domain typically, and whatever happens on the boundary will influence everywhere inside the flow. Okay, so if I have this is the duct, for example, it's some arbitrary crazy shaped cross-sectional duct in the third direction, it's a channel like that. And if you inject slight amount of fluid through one part, and that will affect the entire flow field. That's why we call it an elliptic problem. And elliptic problems typically will have these two terms. The other terms will be zero. Okay. So B square minus 4AC will be less than zero. Now, in this particular case, let's look at whether our problem is parabolic, elliptic, or hyperbolic. What you need to do is map every term in this equation. This is the template with the equation that we have at hand which is the Navier-Stokes equation. So I should be able to show both of them at the same time. I guess I may not. So first thing to notice is in our Navier-Stokes equation, we have a second order term, but there is no cross term. There is no cross product. Okay. So B is zero in our Navier-Stokes equation, the boundary layer, plant to boundary layer equation. Okay. And Okay, there is, th this is the equation I'm talking about. The Navier Stokes equation. The question is, is it there parabolic, elliptic, or hyperbolic? Okay, so I look at one second order term, x2 squared. Okay, and uh, there is no x1, x2, second derivative. And that says that b in the template is equal to 0, and a is equal to mu, because that is a second order term. But is there a c term? So I, I guess I need to go back and forth. Do you, do you, get, do you guys have the notes? We have the nodes, the first thing to observe is the first order terms don't matter. In your definition of the classification, the first order terms don't matter. It's simply the second order term, A, B, and C. In our case, B is 0, A is mu, what is C? If you had a term d square v1 dx2 square, then C will be the coefficient that multiplies that. But we don't have that, right? So C is also equal to? Zero. Okay. So, what does that make the classification? B is zero, C is zero, and A is not zero. But so the total B squared minus AC is equal to zero. That makes it a parabolic equation. Boundary layer equations typically are parabolic equations. Okay. Now, physically, what that means is the information that is coming from here, and this is a question I think that you raised last time about the length scale and I'll come back and talk about it a little bit more. So any information that you put in here can propagate only in the forward direction. There is no mechanism for information to propagate backwards. Okay. The, the, when I say information, if I put a momentum disturbance, I put a needle for a minute and take it. I'm bringing the fluid at that point to rest for a while and then I take it out. That momentum deficit is going to be propagated only this way. If I'm staying here, I would, if I do any measurement here, I wouldn't even know that I have put a needle there. Because parabolic equations have no way of conveying this information back. They are evolutionary. They evolve in the x-one direction. 
But if I put a pin here and ask, is, it, is the pin there or the pin there, the effect of the pin will be felt on both sides because we say it is elliptic in the x1 direction, sorry, in the x2 direction. Elliptic in the x2 direction, but parabolic in the x1 direction. Okay? Any questions on that? Now, this is, remember, the Prandtl boundary layer equation is an approximation from the full Navier-Stokes equation. If you go to Comsol and set this problem up, Comsol will solve the full Navier-Stokes equation. But you should be able to reproduce the, the boundary layer nature of the flow. Okay. In the last class, Pratibha asked a question about what would happen if the length is very small? Would that assumption break down? If you remember that. Okay. And what did we do in the right hand side of this equation? We had another term, mu times d square v1 d x1 square, but that got multiplied by a term like delta over L square. And we said that's going to be small compared to the other terms. So we neglected this term. If this term were there, the equation would be elliptic. Okay, and That would mean a disturbance that I put here will be felt all around. But if I drop this term, I don't have any mechanism for transferring momentum in the X2 uh, in the X, X1 direction. Okay, so if I put a pin, I won't know that a pin is there for a fluid that is coming from here. Or you, am I making sense? This is a fairly difficult concept for you to understand. Yeah. So you're saying that that term you just added in would exist in real fluid? It does exist. It always exists in Navier Stokes equation. We just drop this because it is small compared to that. That's what Prandtl did. So the Prandtl boundary layer equation does not have this term. Okay? But if this term were there, the problem would be classified, reclassified as an elliptic problem, and the information would propagate in all the directions by diffusion and by convection. But if I drop that term, I have no mechanism to convey the information, transfer the information to x one direction. Because this is basically translating the information to all the direction. Okay? That's a good way of putting it. In the x2 direction, it's elliptic because whatever effect I change in the boundaries will be felt in, in the interior. But in the x1 direction, it is parabolic because whatever I do at a point, the information propagates only forward from there. There's no way to propagate it in the backward direction. So, for how the x2 direction thing will change? Uh, because of this term. This term diffuses the momentum in the x2 direction. So if I put a pin and disturb the flow, that will affect the fluid in the next layer and the next layer in the x2 direction. So it, its effect will be propagated both ways in the x2 direction. So you basically need a second order term to transmit information in both directions. The first order term basically conveys it in one direction if you like. In this case, there are A, B, and C. How can you say this? For the Prandtl boundary layer equation? Uh, no. The, no, no. The, 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 uh, only. So, B does not exist. B does not exist in the Prandtl boundary layer. In the X2 direction, how can you derive this DPT from this? Can you derive elliptic equation from this, you mean? I'm not sure. I'm following the question. Oh, oh, okay, okay. Yeah, when I say x2 direction it's elliptic, what I mean by that is um, in that direction there is mechanism for propagating in both both directions. In the x2 coordinate, if I make a perturbation, the perturbation effect can be propagated to both ends in the x2 direction. So you can talk, think of it as an elliptic effect. But as I said, the strict definition of elliptic, parabolic, hyperbolic for a second order equation is coming from this. And it applies only to a second order equation in a two-dimensional domain. And so an elliptic equation is one where if I put a perturbation, it will be sensed from all over, all, all, all over the boundary in both directions. For that, I must have both this term and this term for the elliptic term. But I was kind of loose in saying that you can think of it as 
the boundary layer equation as being elliptic in the x2 direction and parabolic in the x1 direction. Uh, that's not a strict definition. The strict definition you need to come back to this equation. Yeah. Any other questions? So if I let me just touch one last point to reinforce this and then we'll move on. Okay. Uh, this uh, material I just cut and paste from the book by Kundu, who describes this in a uh, somewhat lengthy manner. Now I'm going to ask you to go and, for example, in the next assignment, say solve parental bound, not parental boundary layer equations, solve for flow past a flat plate using ComSol. Okay, how does that differ from solving the parental boundary layer equation? And I say use various viscosities from 0 0.001 to all 10 or 100, the whole range of viscosities. And then um, I should have, I guess, made this uh, simulation for you guys. Um, okay, so let me just draw a sketch. This is for, uh, let me just say, viscosity of 0 0.001. Okay, and another case, viscosity of 10. Okay, we want to find out the growth of the boundary layer. And in both cases, I will have a boundary layer. One will be much thicker than the other one. Which one will be thick, thicker? 10, 1 for this, the delta. If I call this as delta 2, and if I call this delta 1, delta 2, you would expect to be much larger than delta 1. Okay, and you are doing this from Blasius solution, which is what we are going to do now. And you get the profile and everything seems to be fine. And then I ask you to do this in ComSol. Okay? And I ask you to observe. So in ComSol, you are going to do this simulation in the following way. ComSol, remember, you always have to identify a domain. So I say take a domain like this. And start the plate from here. Okay, so the plate boundary condition, no slip boundary condition starts from here. So here you have free stream velocity u. Okay, so it enters with a u velocity. And here you put a slip condition so that the fluid comes slipping past and then hits the plate at this point. Okay, and you do the simulation from here to point zero zero one to here to 10. Using ComSol, not trying to boundary layer equation. Okay, and then I ask you to examine what happens to the velocity field near the tip. So the question that you need to focus is, if I ask you to sample the velocity at a point slightly before the starting of the plate, what would boundary layer theory, the parental boundary layer equations tell you at that point? What would be the velocity? The free stream velocity, the slip velocity. What would Comsol tell you? It will slow it down. Where, which one will be slower of the two cases? If you understand that, you have understood everything about boundary layer theory. Second one, Second one would be slower. slower. Why? The, so this is the same question that we were talking about all along. The how does the fluid that is approaching the tip? Of this plate, know that there is a tip ahead of time. Now, if you do the parent boundary layer equation, it will not know until you hit the plate. Okay? But if you're using the full Navier Stokes equation, the diffusion in the x1, x1 direction will cause it to know it ahead of time. Now, if you make the mu very large, that of it will be taken farther ahead. Okay? So, farther ahead, you will know the effect of the plate is coming. Uh, compared to this case. So this will also be lower than So I think if you understand that, you understood quite a bit about the nature of the parabolic problem, the nature of the parental boundary layer equations, the assumptions that are made in it, a lot of the physics in that. Any questions on that? The, the slower this velocity will be. Okay because the effect on the plate will be propagated upwards, upstream. And if I make that viscosity smaller and smaller, then that effect will go closer and closer to the plate before I, I know that the plate is there. Okay, so you can, I, 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 
That is due to the ability of the fluid to diffuse momentum in the x1 direction, yeah. which we have dropped in the parental boundary layer equation, but ComSol has not dropped it. It will keep it. No, no, no. So it, it, it will also calculate that equation, full equation. It will not simply solve the ex simplified X2 momentum equation for the parental analysis. It will solve the full equation. But what you will find, it's a good assignment to give, but I guess in case our heading comes on, <laughs> to take the Blasius solution that we have and generate the solution from ComSol. And you'll find that they match beautifully. Okay. What that shows is those terms that we have neglected in the parental analysis spontaneously become small in the ComSol calculations. Okay. So that's a validation of the parental concept that these terms are indeed small. Even if you keep them in your calculations and your computations, they will be small. So they will not affect your profile that you're predicting by neglecting those terms. This has been validated experimentally. People have measured the velocity profile inside the boundary layer in great detail using hot wire anemometer and a laser doppler anemometer. Blasius solution agrees perfectly well. And I will show you some of the results from there. Good questions. Okay, so move on. So we have understood a little bit about the nature of the parental boundary line equation. It's parabolic in x1. It's evolutionary. And we have already found out that the boundary layer thickness varies as 1 over square root of Reynolds number. But what we need to do is a lot of hard work solving these parental boundary layer equations to get what is the proportionality constant. It turns out to be probably about 5 or so. But if you want to get quantitatively, functionally we have, but if you want to get quantitatively what the result is, we need to solve. That equation. There are many ways of solving it. One is the Blasius solution, the other one is called the integral method, and you will see both. Now, if I want to get really what I'm interested in is the net drag exerted by the fluid on the plate. And in, in, in more general term, in terms of the aerodynamic shape, what is the net drag exerted uh, by the fluid on the airplane? So that drag coefficient, tau zero, tau zero is the shear stress at the wall, is given by mu again an order of magnitude estimate given by mu times strictly it is db1 dx2 but that's same as u over delta but we already know from scaling analysis what delta is so you substitute for the delta from the previous equation that we have here delta you substitute that and what you will get is an expression for the shear stress of the wall that is mu u square root of rel over l REL is the Reynolds number based on the length of the plate measured from the leading edge. Now we know friction factor definition, same like drag coefficient definition. It is tau zero divided by one half rho u square. Tau zero is the shear stress, force per area. Okay? So substitute the value for tau zero and you get an expression like two divided by square root of Reynolds number. Once again, the drag coefficient, the, the local friction factor varies as inverse of square root of Reynolds number. But the proportionality constant is something that we need to find after solving uh, the equations. But you, you, you must understand, appreciate this idea of a local friction factor. What do you mean by a local friction factor? So friction factor at a particular point. So this is my plate. What is the friction factor at this particular point? That is given by the Reynolds number measured up to that point L. If that is L, then from the leading edge, then that is the friction factor at that point. So it's going to be changing. What would be the friction factor at the leading edge of the plate? Zero. No. One. It's the other way. The Reynolds number is zero because L is zero. At the leading edge of the plate, L is zero, right? We start measuring L from there. So it is L equal to zero and then it just keeps on increasing. So the Reynolds number is zero. That means the friction factor is infinite. Okay, so there is a singularity in the equation. So it's, it has an extremely sharp velocity gradient because if you think about it, the velocity is non-zero just before this point. If you approach this point from the left, you get a non-zero velocity. If you approach it from the right hand side to that point, you get a zero velocity. So the gradient of the velocity at that point is 
infinite, right? For a very small point, the velocity changes from u to zero. So the gradient of the velocity is infinite, and that's why the shear stress and the friction coefficient are all infinite at that point. But very quickly, it'll come down to uh, finite values. Okay, before we solve using the Blasius uh, approach, uh, let's look at a few other concepts. Okay, one is what is the boundary line thickness? As I said, there is no well defined line that will identify that as the boundary line thickness. So, there are several definitions. We're going to see three of them. The first one is just the boundary layer thickness. Okay, and you define that as the distance over which the velocity profile reaches 99% of the free stream velocity. So, what we want is the delta, the boundary layer thickness is such that we want u over capital U should be equal to 0.99. 99% of the free stream velocity. The distance at which this occurs is arbitrarily defined as your boundary layer thickness. Okay, that's the first definition. The second one is called the displacement thickness. There are two ways of looking at this displacement thickness. The first one says, suppose I replace this velocity profile the profile, the boundary layer profile that I have with a step change so that this area is as if there is no flow. Okay, so what should be the thickness of this no flow region such that the mass flow is the same? Mass flow is the same between the inlet and what comes out of this. Okay, so that's the concept. When you translate that concept into an equation, you get an expression for delta star. That's called the displacement thickness. That delta star. Yeah. So delta star is this thickness over which there is no flow. So instead of having this profile, which is the real profile, I'm saying over what prof or what length I should have zero velocity, and then the uniform velocity u. So that the flow rate here is the same as the flow rate that is coming here. Okay? That's the concept. So when you implement that in mathematical language, you have u times dy. That, that is the flow rate, right? Velocity times the area, but area perpendicular to the plate, you're taking length as one. Okay. So it is u times one times dy. And that gives you the actual velocity profile, u is the actual velocity profile, you integrate it between 0 and h, h is actually infinity in an asymptotic sense. Okay, So the left hand side comes from integration of the actual profile, the right hand side comes from the integration of this profile, Okay, which simply says that u times h minus delta star, right, why, because it is u over this distance and the height itself would be total distance minus delta star. So this height multiplied by one area multiplied by the velocity u, which is constant. So this is the same flow rate for the right figure, this is the flow rate for the left figure, and one that would be the same. So I'm asking the question, what should delta star be such that mass flow is balanced? Okay, and that we call as the displacement thickness. It is as if the flow this uniform streaming flow is displaced by a thickness that's a solid. Okay. Any questions on that? So the concept, the equation is here, and then you just rearrange it as delta star equals zero to infinity one minus u over capital U dy. Okay? It's the same equation that is simply rearranged after separating the delta star. Okay. There is an alternate meaning that is given in uh, Kundu, which is also quite interesting to know. It explains this idea of a displacement thickness much better than mathematically. This is the definition. You can say, I'm a mathematician. I'm happy with that definition. That's fine. Okay. But if you want physical intuition, this intuition is one which says, find a thickness that displaces the velocity field. The other one says, it is the displacement of the edge of the boundary layer. So this figure is a little bit uh, messy to understand. So I have the plate starts here, okay, and I have free stream velocity uh, u over a distance of h. Now this is a streamline, 
and so is this. What do we know about stream between streamlines? Uh, what do we know about the nature of the flow rate? It is constant. It's the same flow rate. So if I take this streamline, this streamline ends there. That streamline departs like this. Okay. So the flow rate is going to be the same between these two streamlines. Okay. So you integrate across A and you integrate across B between these two streamlines and equate them. Okay. And here you notice that if I extend this line by a straight line, I get the same height here. From here to there, it is h. Okay. So what should have happened to the velocity in the v in relation to a? Smaller or larger compared to the velocity at a? Smaller. Why? Because these two streamlines are apart the distance of h, the same flow that goes, but now they are apart the distance of h plus delta star. And define delta star as the additional interval. That is my displacement thing. So it's as if the boundary layer causes the flow rate to be displaced by that amount. Okay, so this is the delta star. Okay. Once I understand that, I can then write the expression. Now u times h is the flow rate at a, right? Remember, always it's one perpendicular to the board. Okay, and on the right hand side at b, it is along this. It is u times dy integrated between zero and h plus delta star. That is at the edge of the boundary layer, all the way up to there. Okay. So this I can split into two parts. One as integral of u between zero and h plus u delta star. Why can I do that? That integral can be split into two parts. One takes me to h, the other one goes from h to h plus delta star. But in h plus delta star, the velocity is free stream velocity u because the edge of the boundary layer is here. Outside of the edge of the boundary layer, the velocity is constant, the potential flow velocity. So I can write it like that. And that is the state uh, trans translation of a conceptual idea into the mathematical language and then you just rearrange that as u delta equal to move it to the other side and you get exactly the same expression as we had before. So you can think of this as the definition. This equation defines defines what delta star is, the so-called displacement thickness. The first concept that defined boundary layer thickness delta is reaching 99% of the free stream velocity. The second one is Calculate it according to this equation, a delta star, which gives you another metric, another measure of the boundary layer thickness. Any questions on that? The next concept is another metric, another measure is this idea of a momentum thickness. Okay, so it's very similar. The momentum flux at A, remember, momentum is mass times velocity, right? Now here, rho times u is your um, uh, mass flow rate, rho times u times h, multiplied by the velocity u again. That's why you get u squared. Okay, so the momentum flux through the left boundary at A, where the velocity is uniform, is rho u squared h. The momentum flux at B is calculated in the same way, 0 h plus delta star, rho u squared dy. Okay, and you split it by the same reason, same logic as before. Okay. So that is the momentum at the right point, right boundary. So this is at B and that is at A. So what do you think should happen to the difference in momentum between these two points? For mass, it should be the same. Mass cannot be lost or gained, right? Because we took two streamlines, the mass has to be the same. Oh, can you say the same thing for momentum? Momentum will be higher at A and lower at B. So what happened to the momentum? Can momentum be lost? It's never lost, but the plate applies a friction, a traction. Okay? So it, it, some of the momentum is trans, but what we are doing is calculating the momentum between A and A and B. The momentum can also be transferred from the top boundary and from the bottom boundary. 
okay and that is the reason why these are not exactly balancing between a and b if you take the complete closed control volume it should balance okay so in this case we call this as a deficit a reduction in the momentum the difference in the momentum and we are going to define that as rho u square theta so theta is called the momentum thickness so it's some thickness some measure that says what is the law it's a quantification of what is the loss in momentum between those two points okay so it has the same units as momentum so rho u square theta is equal to the difference between what entered and what left okay and then you do the manipulation and rearrange that equation and you get get an equation for theta and I'm going to ask you to fill all these intermediate algebraic steps but the theta the momentum thickness is ultimately given by this definition u over capital U times 1 minus u over capital U dy so if I know the velocity profile inside the boundary layer which is what this u is okay if I know the velocity profile I can calculate the boundary layer thickness by looking simply at the 99 percentile point you can calculate the mass deficit thickness delta star by simply as integral of 1 minus u over u I can calculate the momentum thickness all these three are three measures of the extent of the boundary layer thickness any questions we will use these concepts later on in so called the integral method that was developed by Juan Carmen to solve the parental boundary layer equations in an approximate way okay so uh, but let's try to see whether we can solve this exactly as was done by Blasius it's called the Blasius solution it almost happened 25 30 years after Prandtl developed these equations and once again I've just summarized the equation the continuity the momentum and the boundary conditions <clears throat> and remember for a flat plate this du dx is zero because u is a constant for a flat plate that's a potential flow for a flat plate so that term will drop out so it's a two-dimensional problem we have the continuity equation in this form so whenever you have a 2d so the problem, the first thing that should come to your mind is introduce a stream function because that will automatically take care of the continuity equation. Okay, So we define the stream function in the traditional way v1 equals d psi dx2 and v2 equals minus d psi dx1. That takes care of the continuity equation automatically for us. Okay, Then what do I do? Now that you have done this assignment quite a, for a long time, you should know. The next step is get rid of all the velocities wherever we have v1 wherever we have v2 put in those definitions for v1 and v2 when you do that you will get rid of all the velocities from here here and these terms and the order of this one will go up by one instead of a second order you will be taking v1 as equal to d psi dx2 so this will become d cube psi dx2 cube and then other terms will correspondingly change and the momentum equation becomes that. Remember by the single stroke of defining the stream function we have taken care of continuity, we have reduced the problem, we have eliminated v1 and v2, we have only one unknown now. If I can find a psi stream function that satisfies this differential equation then I know my velocity for that definitions. Now, have we simplified the problem to some extent because instead of two equations I have only one equation but I have an equation that is third order, highest derivative is third order but it still remains a partial differential equation and it still remains, is it linear or nonlinear? Nonlinear, it still remains nonlinear because my unknown is psi and I have products of psi. So it still remains nonlinear, still remains a partial differential equation. Okay? Blasius' ingenuity here was the following. He recognized that I can use similarity transformation to transform this into an ordinary differential equation. Still nonlinear, because the nature of the problem is nonlinear, so it's not going to go away. But I can transform that into a nonlinear ordinary differential equation, a third order nonlinear ordinary differential equation. What led him and all? you can say why did it take 30 years to discover this and uh, what led him what led him to 
come to that conclusion, an idea that we talked about earlier, that this problem is very similar to the impulsively started plate. If I assume that the convection in the x1 direction and the diffusion in the x2 direction leads to this equation, which is uh, dv1 dt equals mu d square v1 dx2 square. That is the diffusion equation. That equation is parabolic in nature. Okay, So to see the connection, all you need to do is recognize that t here plays the same role. t in the Stokes problem, the impulsively started plate problem, plays the same role as L over U in the boundary layer. Okay, So that is the distance over which a disturbance is convected in the boundary layer problem, but in the moving plate problem, that is the uh, distance by which, uh, again, the disturbance is convected. So what he did was he just went back to what was the similarity transformation that we used in the Stokes problem, the impulsively started plate problem. That was exactly eta equals x2 divided by square root of t. And remember, we use the argument that by looking at these, x2 square t, so t square root of x should have the same dimension if you, when you combine it with mu. So we defined eta combining t, mu, and x2 square. And we came up with the similarity transformation. So he says now t is in this particular problem replaced by x1 over u. So why can't I define a similarity variable as x2 times square root of mu over x1, u over mu x1. Okay, t is replaced by x1 over u. Of course, what is the other way of doing it? You should read the paper that I put on model for general similarity transformation. Okay, where you introduce these coefficients and find these coefficient values so that you get rid of all the independent variables. The two independent variables in this problem are x1 and x2. So essentially, we have followed the same idea. I've introduced x1 and x2, a combination of this, as my new variable. And I'm hoping that I will get rid of x1 and x2 when I subject my equation to this transformation in terms of the new variable. So similarity transformation is a very important technique uh, analytically that was used by Blasius in this case. So you also define the stream function to be this function, unknown function, f which is a function of eta <coughs> multiplied by square root of nu u x1. I have another problem after this, which I'm going to give you as a reading assignment, <coughs> which goes through exactly the same idea on a more complicated problem. But in here, these are the two definitions. One is for eta, the other one is for psi in terms of a new unknown function, and that function is f of eta. So I must get an equation for f as a function of eta an ordinary differential equation. This is a long, tedious process. Okay, What we need to do, it's a straightforward process, particularly if you're comfortable with maple, it's fairly easy to do. But you need to define these two equations in maple and then take all the partial derivatives that appear in the momentum equation. That means you need to take d side dx2, d square side dx1 dx2, d side dx1, d square side dx2 square. So there are five partial derivatives that you need to take, okay? And then plug them all back into this equation and you'll get an equation in terms of the new transformed variable f as a function of eta. So the procedure is straightforward, but for example, I'm taking d eta with respect to dx1, okay? So here is eta. So when I take the derivative of eta with respect to x1, I'll get minus one half x2 square root of u over nu x1 divided by one over x1. And then I replace this by eta over 2. This whole thing is what I define as eta. Okay? So that is only one partial derivative, d eta dx1. Why do I need that? For example, if I need d psi dx1, I'm going to write this as df d eta times d eta dx1 using chain rule. So I need to figure out what d eta dx1 is. Similarly, I need to figure out what d eta dx2 is. These are straightforward derivatives, but you need to figure them out. Once you figure these two out, then you go and calculate d psi dx2, the very first term, okay? Using chain rule like this. That is the same as df dx2 
dx2 the eta okay and i'm just going to again ask you to fill these and that will eventually give you u f prime if you have any questions if you don't follow from step a to step b we are going to please mark that and come to see and go through that which is a fairly straightforward but tedious algebraic manipulation, taking all the partial derivatives, okay? Then do the same thing for d psi dx1, d square psi dx1 dx2, d square psi dx2 square, and then d cube psi dx2 cube. Plug them all into the momentum equation, the five derivatives that we need in the momentum equation, all in terms of f1, f prime, f double prime, f triple prime, etc. Okay, when you plug them in, you're going to get a fairly messy expression that you see here. All the five derivatives that we have calculated, they are plugged in here. And then you factor out the common term, like you have u, u square over 2x1, for example. This is same as u, 2x1, u. And if you look at this carefully, u square over 2x1, so here you will have u, u, and then combining all these will get that term. Multiplied by eta f1 f double prime f prime f double prime and then you have this term f again multiplied by f double prime that gets also u square over 2x1. On the right hand side also you get u square over x1 but nu and nu will cancel out. This cancels out. So in every term we still have x1 Okay, that is present, then we have, we will not have a similar transformation. But luckily, these terms are all the same. So they will cancel out. What you get is 2f prime plus f, f double prime equal to 0. This is called the Blasius equation. This is exactly the information contained here is exactly the same as the practical boundary layer equation. But through similarity transformation, we are able to convert the two PDEs into a single ordinary differential equation. Still nonlinear, which is a nonlinear term here. F F double prime is a nonlinear term there. Okay? So there is no analytical solution to this, even till today. You cannot solve this equation analytically. You need to go to the computer at this stage. So one can be pragmatic and say, if I have to do all this work and go to the computer, why don't I go and set it up and come solve? You get the same result. You don't have to do all these work, right? <laughs> That's me. That's my research. <laughs> Computational fluid dynamics, which says I'm going to get all of them by using computers. Okay. Any questions on that? I've just gone quickly through the concept of a similarity transformation, the rationale for how the transformation is developed from the Stokes the first problem, but there are a lot of derivatives that you need to take, plug it in, and simplify, and it will eventually simplify to this ordinary differential equation third order nonlinear order differential equation. The next step is to convert all the boundary conditions into corresponding conditions for f. The boundary condition that we have, for example, v1 at the entrance to the plate is equal to u. But v1 is defined as d psi dx2. That's the definition, right? So that means d psi dx2 must be equal to u. But we already know what d psi dx2 is which is uf prime. How did we know that? Well, we took all the partial derivatives here in this page. d psi dx2 is there. Okay, d psi dx1 is there. So you use the same information on the boundary condition. Okay, so d psi dx2 must be equal to uf prime, but we want that to be equal to u. So that means f prime must be equal to 1. Okay, because uf prime must be equal to u, as f goes, as eta goes to infinity. Now, how do I get eta goes to infinity? I need to recall what is the definition for eta. Eta is x2 multiplied by u over nu x1. So, when x1 is equal to 0, eta goes to infinity. Okay, that's how I know that. So, the boundary condition I need to impose on the ordinary differential equation is f prime at infinity must be equal to 1. Then take the next condition, v1 at the plate is equal to 0, there is a no slip, but v1 is defined as d psi dx2, definition of stream function, but d psi dx2 is same as uf prime, but this time x2 is 0, x2 is 0 means eta is 0, 
That means f prime at the plate, 0 is equal to 0. Okay, so that's the process that you go through. But remember, we have four conditions, but we have only a third order equation. So these four conditions must consistently transform into three conditions, meaning two of them must be the same. And that happens to be true. For example, V2 at x2 equal to 0, that's the impenetrability condition for the plate. But V2 is defined as d psi dx1. d psi dx1 from the derivatives we know is this long expression here. Okay? So how do we deduce that f0 equals 0 from that? Well, when x2 equal to 0, eta equal to 0. But when eta equal to 0, we already know that f prime is equal to 0. So f must be equal to 0. We must enforce that f is equal to 0, then f prime is 0, that condition is satisfied. Okay, so we have three distinct conditions already. Okay, the fourth condition is v1 as x2 goes to infinity, the far stream condition is u. But v1 by definition is d psi dx2, which from the derivative is u f prime, so that must be equal to u. So as eta goes to infinity, f prime infinity must be equal to 1, which is the same as the first equation. They are the same. So we have a successful similarity transformation. We transform the PDE into a third order ODE. We transform the four conditions into a consistent set of three ordinary differential equations, condition for three ordinary differential equations. As I said, there is no solution to this because it's a nonlinear problem, but it was solved numerically by Blasius in the 30s. That's an amazing feat. Why? Because he had to do it by hand. There was no calculator. There is no computer. He needs to integrate this equation by hand. And he did that. Numerically. Solve this equation. Hmm? In the 30s, yeah. How many of you know how to solve ordinary differential equations by numerical methods? How many of you don't know what to do with it? Any method that comes to your mind, anybody? Exactly, Rangakada method. That's what he used. Right? That was developed by that time. So Rangakada method is an approximate method for integrating ordinary differential equations. So there are methods like that which we will do in a numerical methods course. Here I'm not going to ask you how to do it, but I will give you a table. This is the table that he published as a solution. What does this table have? This table has in the first column eta, my independent variable. In the second column, I have f, f prime, and f double prime. Okay, so if I give you this table, you should be able to interpret it, you should be able to understand how to get the velocity field at any particular point and plot them. Okay, but that is the solution. Now, if I give you this table and say, find me the boundary layer thickness, what would you do? Here is a solution to the Blasius equation. First column is eta, second column is f, third column is f prime, fourth column is f double prime. And I've given you the definition for eta, which is given here, x2 over square root of x1, u over nu. And I say, go and find me, what is the boundary layer thickness? It will be the x2 that you will get from the day eta. What you want is the velocity to be reaching 99% of the free stream velocity. Okay, So you need to know how is v1 given. v1 is given if you go back. So all these derivatives are very important. v1 is d psi dx2, right? According to this definition, v1 is d psi dx2. But d psi dx2 is u times f prime. So I want v1 to be equal to 0.99 of u. That means I want u f prime to be equal to 0.99 u. That means I want my f prime to be equal to 0.99. That kind of a logic you should be able to do to interpret the results. So in the table, all I need to do is go for, look for the value of f prime that is 0.99. Here it is. So when eta is equal to 5, I've reached the edge of the boundary layer. Okay? So the, the expression that I would have is eta is equal to 5, 
and that is equal to the definition that I have here. Now I can replace x2 by delta, delta divided by square root of x1 u over nu. That gives me the boundary layer thickness. So it tells me that the boundary layer thickness varies as equal to 5 times square root of x times nu over u. This number 5 was not, I was not getting from an argument, dimensional argument. I was just getting that delta is proportional to square root of x. But I not, now I know that the proportionality constant is 5. All this work of Blasius is to just get that number. Do you understand what I mean by this? So you should be able to get from this figure, for example, what is the shear stress at the wall. How would you do that? We'll have to go and look at the definition. I guess we're running out of time, right? Definition for shear stress and relate that to F double prime. Turns out that the shear stress is related to this number at the wall. Shear stress at the wall is related to that number. So go through that, but I think I will cover this because it is important in the next class and we'll pick up from there. Okay, any questions? Please spend some time. Remember, seven hours for one hour of lecture. <laughs> because these are material that are I'm going through fairly rapidly because I need to do the same thing for heat and mass transfer too. I'm compressing the course a little bit. So you need to put the time to understand this. Okay, stop it.